Track Five, The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, read by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Track Five, The First Epoch, Thirteen. The exposed situation of the churchyard had obliged me to be cautious in choosing the position that I was to occupy. The main entrance to the church was on the side next to the burial ground, and the door was screened by a porch walled in on either side. After some little hesitation, caused by natural reluctance to conceal myself, indispensable as that concealment was to the object in view, I had resolved on entering the porch. A loophole window was pierced in each of its side walls. Through one of these windows I could see Mrs. Fairley's grave. The other looked towards the stone quarry in which the sexton's cottage was built. Before me, fronting the porch entrance, was a patch of bare burial ground, a line of low stone wall, and a strip of lonely brown hill, with the sunset clouds sailing heavily over it before a strong steady wind. No living creature was visible or audible. No bird flew by me, no dog barked from the sexton's cottage. The pauses in the dull beating of the surf were filled up by the dreary rustling of the dwarf trees near the grave, and the cold, faint bubble of the brook over its stony bed. A dreary scene, and a dreary hour. My spirits sank fast as I counted out the minutes of the evening in my hiding-place under the church porch. It was not twilight yet. The light of the setting sun still lingered in the heavens a little more than the first half-hour of my solitary watch had elapsed when I heard footsteps and a voice. The footsteps were approaching from the other side of the church, and the voice was a woman's. "'Don't you fret, my dear, about the letter?' said the voice. "'I gave it to the lad quite safe, and the lad took it from me without a word. He went his way, and I went mine, and not a living soul followed me afterwards, that I'll warrant.' These words strung up my attention to a pitch of expectation that was almost painful. There was a pause of silence, but the footsteps still advanced. In a moment two persons, both women, passed within my range of view from the porch window. They were walking straight towards the grave, and therefore they had their backs turned towards me. One of the women was dressed in a bonnet and shawl. The other wore a long travelling cloak of a dark blue colour, with the hood drawn over her head. A few inches of her gown were visible below the cloak. My heart beat fast as I noticed the colour. It was white. After advancing about half-way between the church and the grave, they stopped, and the woman in the cloak turned her head towards her companion. But her side face, which her bonnet might now have allowed me to see, was hidden by the heavy projecting edge of the hood. "'Mind you keep that comfortable warm cloak on,' said the same voice I had heard already the voice of the woman in the shawl. Mrs. Tardis right about your looking too particular. Yesterday all in white. I'll walk about a little while while you're here. Churchyard's not being at all in my way. Whatever they may be in yours. Finish what you want to do before I come back, and let us be sure and get home again before night. With these words she turned about, and retracing her steps, advanced with her face towards me. It was the face of an elderly woman, brown, rugged, and healthy, with nothing dishonest or suspicious in the look of it. Close to the church she stopped to pull her shawl closer round her. Queer, she said to herself, always queer, with her whims and her ways, ever since I can remember her. Harmless, though, as harmless poor soul as a little child. She sighed, looked about the burial ground nervously, shook her head, as if the dreary prospect by no means pleased her, and disappeared round the corner of the church. I doubted for a moment whether I ought to follow and speak to her or not. My intense anxiety to find myself face to face with her companion helped me to decide in the negative. I could ensure seeing the woman in the shawl by waiting near the churchyard till she came back, although it seemed more than doubtful whether she would give me the information of which I was in search. The person who delivered the letter was of little consequence. The person who had written it 
was the one centre of interest and the one source of information, and that person, I now felt convinced, was before me in the churchyard. While these ideas were passing through my mind, I saw the woman in the cloak approach close to the grave, and stand looking at it for a little while. Then she glanced all around her, and taking a white linen cloth or handkerchief from under her cloak, turned aside towards the brook. The little stream ran into the churchyard under a tiny archway in the bottom of the wall, and ran out again, after a winding course of a few dozen yards, under a similar opening. She dipped the cloth in the water and returned to the grave. I saw her kiss the white cross, then kneel down before the inscription, and apply her wet cloth to the cleansing of it. After consideration how I could show myself with the least possible chance of frightening her, I resolved to cross the wall before me, to skirt around outside, and to enter the churchyard again by the stile near the grave, in order that she might see me as I approached. She was so absorbed over her employment that she did not hear me coming until I had stepped over the stile. Then she looked up, started to her feet with a faint cry, and stood facing me in speechless, motionless terror. "'Don't be frightened,' I said. "'Surely you remember me?' I stopped while I spoke, then advanced a few steps gently, then stopped again, and so approached by little and little, until I was close to her. If there had been any doubt still left in my mind, it must have been now set at rest. There, speaking affrightedly for itself, there was the same face confronting me over Mrs. Fairley's grave, which had first looked into mine on the high road at night. "'You remember me?' I said. "'We met very late, and I helped you to find the way to London. Surely you've not forgotten that?' Her features relaxed, and she drew a heavy breath of relief. I saw the new life of recognition stirring slowly under the death-like stillness which fear had set on her face. "'Don't attempt to speak to me just yet,' so I went on. "'Take time to recover yourself. "'Take time to feel quite certain that I am a friend.' Y "'You are very kind to me,' she murmured. "'As kind now as you were then.' She stopped, and I kept silence on my side. I was not granting time for composure to her only. I was gaining time also for myself. Under the one wild evening light, that woman and I were met together again a grave between us, the dead about us, the lonesome hills closing us around on every side. The time, the place, the circumstance under which we now stood face to face in the evening stillness of that dreary valley, the lifelong interests which might hang suspended on the next chance words that passed between us, the sense that, for aught I knew to the contrary, the whole future of Laura Fairley's life might be determined for good or for evil by my winning or losing the confidence of the forlorn creature who stood trembling by her mother's grave, all threatened to shake the steadiness and self-control on which every inch of the progress I might yet make now depended. I tried hard, as I felt this, to possess myself of all my resources. I did my utmost to turn the few moments for reflection to the best account. Are you calmer now? I said, as soon as I thought it time to speak again. Can you talk to me without feeling frightened, and without forgetting that I'm a friend?" "'How did you come here?' she asked, without noticing what I had just said to her. "'Don't you remember my telling you, when we last met, that I was going to Cumberland? I've been in Cumberland ever since. I've been staying all the time at Limeridge House.' "'At Limeridge House?' Her pale face brightened as she repeated the words, her wandering eyes fixed on me with sudden interest. "'Ah! how happy you must have been!' she said, looking at me eagerly, without a shadow of its former distrust left in her expression. I took advantage of her newly aroused confidence in me to observe her face, with an attention and a curiosity which I had hitherto restrained myself from showing for caution's sake. I looked at her, with my mind full of that other lovely face, which had so ominously recalled her to my memory on the terrace by moonlight. I had seen Anne Catherick's likeness in Miss Fairley. Now I saw Miss Fairley's likeness in Anne Catherick, saw it all the more clearly because the points of dissimilarity between the two 
were presented to me as well as the points of resemblance. In the general outline of the countenance and general proportion of the features, in the colour of the hair, and in the little nervous uncertainty about the lips, in the height and size of the figure and the carriage of the head and body, the likeness appeared even more startling than I had ever felt it to be yet. But there the resemblance ended, and the dissimilarity in details began. The delicate beauty of Miss Fairley's complexion, the transparent clearness of her eyes, the smooth purity of her skin, the tender bloom of colour on her lips, were all missing from the worn, weary face that was now turned towards mine. Although I hated myself for even thinking such a thing, still, while I looked at the woman before me, the idea would force itself into my mind that one sad change in the future was all that was wanting to make the likeness complete, which I now saw to be so imperfect in detail. If ever sorrow and suffering set their profaning marks on the youth and beauty of Miss Fairley's face, then and then only, Anne Catherick and she would be the twin sisters of chance resemblance, the living reflections of one another. I shuddered at the thought. There was something horrible in the blind, unreasoning distrust of the future which the mere passage of it through my mind seemed to imply. It was a welcome interruption to be roused by feeling Anne Catherick's hand laid on my shoulder. The touch was as stealthy and as sudden as that other touch which had petrified me from head to foot on the night when we first met. "'You are looking at me, but you are thinking of something,' she said, with her strange, breathless rapidity of utterance. "'What is it?' "'Nothing extraordinary,' I answered. "'I was only wondering how you came here.' "'I came with a friend who is very good to me. I have only been here two days.' "'And you found your way to this place yesterday?' "'How do you know that?' "'I only guessed it.' She turned from me, and knelt before the inscription once more. "'Where should I go if not here?' she said. "'The friend who is better than a mother to me is the only friend I have to visit in Limeridge. "'Oh, it makes my heart ache to see a stain on her tomb. "'It ought to be kept as white as snow, for her sake. "'I was tempted to begin cleaning it yesterday, but I can't help coming back to go on with it to-day. Is there anything wrong in that? I hope not. Surely nothing can be wrong that I do for Mrs. Fairley's sake." The old grateful sense of her benefactress's kindness was evidently the ruling idea still in the poor creature's mind, the narrow mind, which had but too plainly opened to no other lasting impression since that first impression of her younger and happier days. I saw that my chance of winning her confidence lay in encouraging her to proceed with the artless employment which she had come to the burial-ground to pursue. She resumed it at once, on my telling her that she might do so. Touching the hard marble as tenderly as if it had been a sentient thing, and whispering the words of the inscription to herself over and over again, as if the lost days of her girlhood had returned, and she was patiently learning her lessons once more at Mrs. Fairley's knees. "'Should you wonder very much,' I said, preparing the way as cautiously as I could for the questions that were to come, "'if I owned that it is a satisfaction to me, as well as a surprise, to see you here? I felt very uneasy about you after you left me in the cab.' She looked up quickly and suspiciously. "'Uneasy?' she repeated. "'Why?' A strange thing happened after we parted that night. Two men overtook me in a chaise. They did not see where I was standing, but they stopped near me, and spoke to a policeman on the other side of the way. She instantly suspended her employment. The hand holding the damp cloth with which she had been cleaning the inscription dropped to her side. The other hand grasped the marble cross at the head of the grave. Her face turned towards me slowly, with the blank look of terror set rigidly on it once more. I went on at all hazards. It was too late now to draw back. The two men spoke to the policeman, I said, and asked him if he had seen you. He had not seen you, and then one of the men spoke again, and said you had escaped from his asylum. She sprang to her feet, as if my last words had set the pursuers on her track. "'Stop, and hear the end,' I cried. "'Stop, and you shall know how I befriended you. A word from me would have told the men which way you had gone, and I never spoke that word. I helped you escape. I made it safe and certain. Think. 
Try to think, try to understand what I tell you. My manner seemed to influence her more than my words. She made an effort to grasp the new idea. Her hands shifted the damp cloth hesitatingly from one to the other, exactly as they had shifted the little travelling bag on the night when I first saw her. Slowly, the purpose of my words seemed to force its way through the confusion and agitation of her mind. Slowly, her features relaxed, and her eyes looked at me with their expression gaining in curiosity, what it was fast losing in fear. "'You don't think I ought to be in the asylum, do you?' she said. "'Certainly not. I'm glad you escaped from it. I'm glad I helped you.' "'Yes, yes, you did help me indeed. You helped me at the hard part,' she went on a little vacantly. "'It was easy to escape, or I should not have got away. They never suspected me as they suspected the others. I was so quiet and so obedient, and so easily frightened.' The finding London was the hard part, and there you helped me. Did I thank you at the time? I thank you now very kindly. Was the asylum far away from where you met me? Come, show that you believe me to be your friend, and tell me where it was. She mentioned the place, a private asylum, as its situation informed me, a private asylum not very far from the spot where I had seen her, and then with evident suspicion of the use to which I might put her answer, anxiously repeated her former inquiry. "'You don't think I ought to be taken back to you?' "'Once again, I'm glad you escaped. I'm glad you prospered well after you left me,' I answered. "'You said you had a friend in London to go to. Did you find the friend?' "'Yes. It was very late. But there was a girl up at needlework in the house, and she helped me to rouse Mrs. Clements.' Mrs. Clements is my friend, a good, kind woman, but not like Mrs. Fairley. Ah, nobody is like Mrs. Fairley. Is Mrs. Clements an old friend of yours? Have you known her a long time? Yes, she was a neighbour of ours once at home in Hampshire, and liked me and took care of me when I was a little girl, years ago. She went away from us and wrote down in my prayer book for me where she was going to live in London, and said, if you're ever in trouble, Anne, come to me. I have no husband alive to say me nay, and no children to look after. I will take care of you. Kind words, were they not? I suppose I remember them, because they were kind. It's little enough I, I remember besides. Little enough. Little enough. Had you no mother or father to take care of you? Father, I never saw him. I never heard mother speak of him. Father, Ah, dear, he is dead, I suppose. And your mother? Uh, I don't get on well with her. We are a trouble and a fear to each other. A trouble and a fear to each other? At those words the suspicion crossed my mind for the first time that her mother might be the person who had placed her under restraint. Don't ask me about my mother, she went on. I'd rather talk of Mrs. Clements. Mrs. Clements is like you. She doesn't think that I ought to be back in the asylum and she is as glad as you are that I escaped from it. She cried over my misfortune, and said it must be kept secret from everybody. Her misfortune. In what sense was she using that word? In a sense which might explain her motive in writing the anonymous letter? In a sense which might show it to be the too common and too customary motive that has led many a woman to interpose anonymous hindrances to the marriage of the man who has ruined her? I resolved to attempt the clearing up of this doubt before more words passed between us on either side. What misfortune? I asked. The misfortune of my being shut up, she answered, with every appearance of feeling surprised at my question. What other misfortune could there be? I determined to persist as delicately and forbearingly as possible. It was of very great importance to me that I should be absolutely sure of every step in the investigation, which I now gained in advance. "'There is another misfortune,' I said, to which a woman may be liable, and by which she may suffer lifelong sorrow and shame. "'What is it?' she asked eagerly. "'The misfortune of believing too innocently in her own virtue, and in the faith and honour of the man she loves,' I answered. She looked up at me with the artless bewilderment of a child not the slightest confusion or change of colour, not the faintest trace of any secret consciousness of shame struggling to the surface 
appeared in her face, that face which betrayed every other emotion with such transparent clearness. No words that ever were spoken could have assured me, as her look and manner now assured me, that the motive which I had assigned for her writing the letter and sending it to Miss Fairley was plainly and distinctly the wrong one. That doubt, at any rate, was now set at rest, but the very removal of it opened a new prospect of uncertainty. The letter, as I knew from positive testimony, pointed to Sir Percival Glyde, though it did not name him. She must have had some strong motive, originating in some deep sense of injury, for secretly denouncing him to Miss Fairley in such terms as she had employed, and that motive was unquestionably not to be traced to the loss of her innocence and her character. Whatever wrong he might have inflicted on her, it was not of that nature. Of what nature could it be? "'I don't understand you,' she said, after evidently trying hard and trying in vain to discover the meaning of the words I had last said to her. "'Never mind,' I answered. "'Let's go on with what we were talking about. Tell me how long you stayed with Mrs. Clements in London, and how you came here.' "'How long?' she repeated. I, "'I stayed with Mrs. Clements till we both came to this place two days ago.' "'You're living in the village, then?' I said. "'It is strange that I should not have heard of you, though you've only been here two days.' Uh, "'No, no, no, not in the village. Three miles away at a farm. Do you know the farm? They call it Todd's Corner.' I remembered the place perfectly. We'd often pass by it on our drives was one of the oldest farms in the neighbourhood, situated in a solitary, sheltered spot, inland at the junction of two hills. "'They are relations of Mrs. Clements at Todd's Corner,' she went on, "'and they often asked her to go and see them. She said she would go and take me with her, for the quiet and the fresh air. It was very kind, was it not? I should have gone anywhere to be quiet and safe and out of the way. But when I heard that Todd's Corner was near Limeridge, oh, I was so happy! I would have walked all the way barefoot to get there, and see the schools and the village and Limeridge House again. They are very good people at Todd's Corner. I hope I shall stay there a long time. There is only one thing I don't like about them, and I don't like about Mrs. Clements. What is it? They will tease me about dressing all in white. They say it looks so particular. How do they know? Mrs. Fairley knew best. Mrs. Fairley would never have made me wear this ugly blue cloak. Ah! she was fond of white in her lifetime, and here is white stone about her grave, and I am making it whiter for her sake. She often wore white herself, and she always dressed her little daughter in white. Is Miss Fairley well and happy? Does she wear white now, as she used when she was a girl?" Her voice sank when she put the questions about Miss Fairley, and she turned her head further and further away from me. I thought they detected, in the alteration of her manner, an uneasy consciousness of the risk she had run in sending the anonymous letter, and I instantly determined so to frame my answer as to surprise her into owning it. "'Miss Fairley was not very well or very happy this morning,' I said. She murmured a few words, but they were spoken so confusedly and in such a low tone that I could not even guess what they meant. "'Did you ask me why Miss Fairley was neither well nor happy this morning?' I continued. No, she said quickly and eagerly. Oh, no, I never asked that. I will tell you without your asking, I went on. Miss Fairley has received your letter. She had been down on her knees for some little time past, carefully removing the last weather stains left about the inscription while we were speaking together. The first sentence of the words I had just addressed to her made her pause in her occupation and turn slowly without rising from her knees so as to face me. The second sentence literally petrified her. The cloth she had been holding dropped from her hands, her lips fell apart, all the little colour that there was naturally in her face left it in an instant. "'How do you know?' she said faintly. "'Who showed it to you?' The blood rushed back into her face, rushed overwhelmingly, as the sense rushed upon her mind that her own words had betrayed her. She struck her hands together in despair. I, I never wrote it. She gasped affrightedly. I know nothing about it. Yes, I said. You wrote it, and you know about it. It was wrong to send such a letter. It was wrong to frighten Miss Fairley. If you had anything to say that it was right and necessary for her to hear, 
you should have gone yourself to Limeridge House. You should have spoken to the young lady with your own lips. She crouched down over the flat stone of the grave, till her face was hidden on it and made no reply. Miss Fairley will be as good and kind to you as her mother was, if you meant well, I went on. Miss Fairley will keep your secret, and not let you come to any harm. Will you see her to-morrow at the farm? Will you meet her in the garden at Limeridge House? Oh, if I could die and be hidden and at rest with you! Her lips murmured the words close to the gravestone, murmured them in tones of passionate endearment to the dead remains beneath. You know I love your child for your sake. Oh, Mrs. Fairley, Mrs. Fairley, tell me how to save her. Be my darling and my mother once more, and tell me what to do for the best. I heard her lips kissing the stone. I saw her hands beating on it passionately. The sound and sight deeply affected me. I stooped down, and took the poor, helpless hands tenderly in mine, and tried to soothe her. It was useless. She snatched her hands from me never moved her face from the stone. Seeing the urgent necessity of quieting her at any hazard and by any means, I appealed to the only anxiety that she appeared to feel, in connection with me and with my opinion of her, the anxiety to convince me of her fitness to be mistress of her own actions. "'Come, come,' I said quietly. "'Try to compose yourself, or you'll make me alter my opinion of you.' Don't let me think that the person who put you in the asylum might have had some excuse. The next words died away on my lips. The instant I risked that chance reference to the person who had put her in the asylum, she sprang up on her knees. A most extraordinary and startling change passed over her. Her face, at all ordinary times, so touching to look at in its nervous sensitiveness, weakness and uncertainty, became suddenly darkened by an expression of maniacally intense hatred and fear, which communicated a wild, unnatural force to every feature. Her eyes dilated in the dim evening light, like the eyes of a wild animal. She caught up the cloth that had fallen at her side, as if it had been a living creature that she could kill, and crushed it in both her hands with such convulsive strength that the few drops of moisture left in it trickled down on the stone beneath her. "'Talk of something else,' she said, whispering through her teeth. "'I shall lose myself if you talk like that.' The very vestige of the gentler thoughts which had filled her mind hardly a minute since seemed to be swept from it now. It was evident that the impression left by Mrs. Fairley's kindness was not, as I had supposed, the only strong impression on her memory. With the grateful remembrance of her schooldays at Limeridge, there existed the vindictive remembrance of the wrong inflicted on her by her confinement in the asylum. Who had done that wrong? Could it really be her mother? It was hard to give up, pursuing the inquiry to that final point, but I forced myself to abandon all idea of continuing it. Seeing her as I saw her now, it would have been cruel to think of anything but the necessity and the humanity of restoring her composure. "'I'll talk of nothing to distress you,' I said soothingly. "'You want something?' she answered sharply and suspiciously. "'Don't look at me like that. Speak to me. Tell me what you want.' I only want you to quiet yourself, when you're calmer, to think over what I've said." Said? She paused, twisted the cloth in her hands, backwards and forwards, and whispered to herself, "'What is it he said?' She turned again towards me, and shook her head impatiently. "'Why don't you help me?' she asked with angry suddenness. "'Yes, yes,' I said, "'I will help you. You will soon remember. I ask you to see Miss Fairley to-morrow, and to tell her the truth about the letter. Ah, Miss Fairley, Fairley, Fairley!" The mere utterance of the loved familiar name seemed to quiet her. Her face softened and grew like itself again. "'You need have no fear of Miss Fairley,' I continued, and no fear of getting into trouble through the letter. She knows so much about it already that you will have no difficulty in telling her all. There can be little necessity for concealment, where there is hardly anything left to conceal. You mention no names in the letter, but Miss Fairley knows that the person you write of is Sir Percival Glyde. The instant I pronounced that name, she started to her feet, 
and a scream burst from her that rang through the churchyard and made my heart leap in me with the terror of it the dark deformity of the expression which had just left her face lowered on it once more with doubled and trebled intensity the shriek of the name the reiterated look of hatred and fear that instantly followed told all not even a last doubt now remained her mother was guiltless of imprisoning her in the asylum a man had shut her up and that man was sir percival glyde the scream had reached other ears than mine on one side i heard the door of the sexton's cottage open on the other i heard the voice of her companion the woman in the shawl the woman whom she had spoken of as mrs clements i'm coming i'm coming cried the voice from behind the clump of dwarf trees in a moment more mrs clements hurried into view who are you she cried facing me resolutely as she set her foot on the stile how dare you frighten a poor helpless woman like that she was at anne catherick's side and had put one arm round her before i could answer what is it my dear she said what has he done to you nothing the poor creature answered nothing i am only frightened mrs clements turned on me with fearless indignation for which i respected her i should be heartily ashamed of myself if i deserved that angry look i said but i do not deserve it i have unfortunately startled her without intending it this is not the first time she has seen me ask her yourself and she will tell you that i am incapable of willingly harming her or any woman i spoke distinctly so that anne catherick might hear and understand me and i saw that the words and their meaning had reached her yes yes she said he was good to me once he helped me she whispered the rest into her friend's ear strange indeed said mrs clements with a look of perplexity it makes all the difference though i am sorry i spoke so rough to you sir but you must own that appearances looked suspicious to a stranger it is more my fault than yours for humouring her whims and letting her be alone in such a place as this come my dear come home now i thought the good woman looked a little uneasy at the prospect of the walk back and i offered to go with them until they were both within sight of home mrs clements thanked me civilly and declined she said that they were sure to meet some of the farm labourers as soon as they got to the moor try to forgive me i said when anne catherick took her friend's arm to go away innocent as i had been of any intention to terrify and agitate her my heart smote me as i looked at the poor pale frightened face i will try she answered but you know too much i am afraid you will always frighten me now mrs clements glanced at me and then shook her head pityingly good night sir she said you couldn't help it i know but i wish it was me you had frightened not her they moved a few steps i thought they'd left me but anne suddenly stopped and separated herself from her friend wait a little she said i must say good-bye she returned to the grave rested both hands tenderly on the marble cross and kissed it i'm better now she sighed looking up at me quietly i forgive you she joined her companion again and they left the burial ground i saw them stop near the church and speak to the sexton's wife who had come from the cottage and had waited watching us from a distance then they went on again up the path that led to the moor i looked after anne catherick as she disappeared till all trace of her had faded in the twilight i looked as anxiously and as sorrowfully as if that was the last i was to see in this weary world of the woman in white end of track five The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Read by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Track 6. The First Epoch. 14 half an hour later i was back at the house and was informing miss halcombe of all that had happened she listened to me from beginning to end with a steady silent attention 
which in a woman of her temperament and disposition was the strongest proof that could be offered of the serious manner in which my narrative affected her. My mind misgives me, was all she said when I had done. My mind misgives me sadly about the future. The future may depend, I suggested, on the use we make of the present. It is not improbable that Anne Catherick may speak more readily and unreservedly to a woman than she has spoken to me. If Miss Fairley—' "'Not to be thought of for a moment,' interposed Miss Halcombe, in her most decided manner. "'Let me suggest, then,' I continued, "'that you should see Anne Catherick yourself, and do all you can to win her confidence. For my own part I shrink from the idea of alarming the poor creature a second time, as I have most unhappily alarmed her already.' Do you see any objection to accompanying me to the farmhouse to-morrow?" "'None whatever. I will go anywhere and do anything to serve Laura's interests. What did you say the place was called?' "'You must know it well. It's called Todd's Corner.' "'Certainly. Todd's Corner is one of Mr. Fairley's farms. Our dairymaid here is the farmer's second daughter. She goes backwards and forwards constantly between this house and her father's farm, and she may have heard or seen something which may be useful for us to know. Shall I ascertain at once, if the girl is downstairs?" She rang the bell, and sent the servant with his message. He returned, and announced that the dairymaid was then at the farm. She had not been there for the last three days, and the housekeeper had given her leave to go home for an hour or two that evening. "'I can speak to her to-morrow,' said Miss Halcombe, when the servant had left the room again. "'In the meantime, let me thoroughly understand the object to be gained by my interview with Anne Catherick. Is there any doubt in your mind that the person who confined her in the asylum was Sir Percival Glyde?" "'There is no shadow of a doubt. The only mystery that remains is the mystery of his motive. Looking to the great difference between his station in life and hers, which seems to preclude all idea of the most distant relationship between them, it is of the last importance, even assuming she really required to be placed under restraint, to know why he should have been the person to assume the serious responsibility of shutting her up. In a private asylum, I think you said. Yes, in a private asylum, where a sum of money which no poor person could afford to give must have been paid for her maintenance as a patient. Oh, I see where the doubt lies, Mr. Hartwright, but I promise you that it shall be set at rest, whether Anne Catherick assists us to-morrow or not. Sir Percival Glyde shall not be long in this house without satisfying Mr. Gilmore and satisfying me. My sister's future is the dearest care in life, and I have influence enough over her to give me some power, where her marriage is concerned in the disposal of it." We parted for the night. After breakfast the next morning an obstacle, which the events of the evening before had put out of my memory, interposed to prevent our proceeding immediately to the farm. This was my last day at Limeridge House, and it was necessary, as soon as the post came in, to follow Miss Halcombe's advice, and to ask Mr. Fairley's permission to shorten my engagement by a month, in consideration of an unforeseen necessity for my return to London. Fortunately, for the probability of this exercise, so far as appearances were concerned, the post brought me two letters from London friends that morning. I took them away at once to my own room, and sent the servant with a message for Mr. Fairley, requesting to know when I could see him on a matter of business. I awaited the man's return, free from the slightest feeling of anxiety about the manner in which his master might receive my application. With Mr. Fairley's leave, or without it, I must go. The consciousness of having now taken the first step on the dreary journey which was henceforth to separate my life from Miss Fairley's, seemed to have blunted my sensibility to every consideration connected with myself. I had done with my poor man's touchy pride, I had done with all my little artist vanities. No insolence of Mr. Fairley's, if he chose to be insolent, could wound me now. The servant returned with a message for which I was not unprepared. Mr. Fairley regretted that the state of his health that particular morning was such as to preclude all hope of his having the pleasure of receiving me. He begged, therefore, that I would accept his apologies, and kindly communicate what I had to say in the form of a letter. Similar messages to this had reached me at various intervals during my three months' residence in the house. Throughout the whole of that period Mr. Fairley had been rejoiced to possess me, but had never been well enough to see me for a second time. The servant took every fresh batch of drawings that I mounted and restored back to his master, with my respects, 
and returned empty-handed with Mr. Caffelli's kind compliments, best thanks, and sincere regrets that the state of his health still obliged him to maintain a solitary prisoner in his own room. A more satisfactory arrangement to both sides could not possibly have been adopted. It would be hard to say which of us, under the circumstances, felt the most grateful sense of obligation to Mr. Fairley's accommodating nerves. I sat down at once to write the letter, expressing myself in it as civilly, as clearly, and as briefly as possible. Mr. Fairley did not hurry his reply. Nearly an hour elapsed before the answer was placed in my hands. It was written with beautiful regularity and neatness of character, in violet-coloured ink, on note-paper as smooth as ivory and almost as thick as cardboard, and it addressed me in these terms. Mr. Fairley's compliments to Mr. Hartwright. Mr. Fairley is more surprised and disappointed than he can say, in the present state of his health, by Mr. Hartwright's application. Mr. Fairley is not a man of business, but he has consulted his steward, who is, and that person confirms Mr. Fairley's opinion that Mr. Hartwright's request to be allowed to break engagement cannot be justified by any necessity whatever, excepting perhaps a case of life and death. If the highly appreciative feeling towards art and its professors, which it is the consolation and happiness of Mr. Fairley's suffering existence to cultivate, should be easily shaken, Mr. Hartwright's present proceeding would have shaken it. It has not done so, except in the instance of Mr. Hartwright himself. Having stated his opinion, so far, that is to say, as acute nervous suffering will allow him to state anything, Mr. Fairley has nothing to add but the expression of his decision in reference to the highly irregular application that has been made to him, perfect repose of body and mind being to the last degree important in his case. Mr. Fairley will not suffer Mr. Hartwright to disturb that repose by remaining in the house under circumstances of an essentially irritating nature to both sides. Accordingly, Mr. Fairley waives his right of refusal, purely with a view to the preservation of his own tranquillity, and informs Mr. Hartwright that he may go. I folded the letter up, and put it away with my other papers. The time had been when I should have resented it as an insult. I accepted it now as a written release from my engagement. It was off my mind, it was almost out of my memory, when I went downstairs to the breakfast-room and informed Miss Halcombe that I was ready to walk with her to the farm. "'Has Mr. Fairley given you a satisfactory answer?' she asked as we left the house. "'He has allowed me to go, Miss Halcombe.' She looked at me quickly, and then, for the first time since I had known her, took my arm of her own accord. No words could have expressed so delicately that she understood how the permission to leave my employment had been granted, and that she gave me her sympathy, not as my superior, but as my friend. I had not felt the man's insolent letter, but I felt deeply the woman's atoning kindness. On our way to the farm we arranged that Miss Halcombe was to enter the house alone, and that I was to wait outside within call. We adopted this mode of proceeding from an apprehension that my presence, after what had happened in the churchyard the evening before, might have the effect of renewing Anne Catherick's nervous dread, and of rendering her additionally distrustful of the advances of a lady who was a stranger to her. Miss Halcombe left me with the intention of speaking in the first instance to the farmer's wife, of whose friendly readiness to help her in any way she was well assured, while I waited for her in the near neighbourhood of the house. I had fully expected to be left alone for some time. To my surprise, however, little more than five minutes had elapsed before Miss Halcombe returned. "'Does Anne Catherick refuse to see you?' I asked in astonishment. "'Anne Catherick is gone,' replied Miss Halcombe. "'Gone?' "'Gone with Mrs. Clements. They both left the farm at eight o'clock this morning.' I could say nothing. I could only feel that our last chance of discovery had gone with them. "'All that Mrs. Todd knows about her guests I know,' Miss Halcombe went on, "'and it leaves me as it leaves her in the dark. They both came back safe last night after they left you, and they passed the first part of the evening with Mr. Todd's family as usual.' Just before supper-time, however, Anne Catherick startled them all by being suddenly seized with faintness. She had had a similar attack of a less alarming kind on the day she arrived at the farm, and Mrs. Todd had connected it on that occasion with something she was reading at the time in our local newspaper, which lay on the farm table, and which she had taken up only a minute or two before. 
Does Mrs. Todd know what particular passage in the newspaper affected her in that way? I inquired. No, replied Miss Halcombe. She had looked it over, and had seen nothing in it to agitate any one. I asked leave, however, to look it over in my turn, and at the very first page I opened I found that the editor had enriched his small stock of news by drawing upon our family affairs, and had published my sister's marriage engagement, among his other announcements, copied from the London papers of marriages in high life. I concluded at once that this was the paragraph which had so strangely affected Anne Catherick, and I thought I saw in it also the origin of the letter which she had sent to our house the next day. And there can be no doubt in either case. But what did you hear about her second attack of faintness yesterday evening? Nothing. The cause of it is a complete mystery. There was no stranger in the room, the only visitor was our dairymaid, who, as I told you, is one of Mr. Todd's daughters, and the only conversation was the usual gossip about local affairs. They heard her cry out, and saw her turn deathly pale, without the slightest apparent reason. Mrs. Todd and Mrs. Clements took her upstairs, and Mrs. Clements remained with her. They were heard talking together until long after the usual bedtime, and early this morning Mrs. Clements took Mrs. Todd aside, and amazed her beyond all power of expression by saying they must go. The only explanation Mrs. Todd could extract from her quest was that something had happened, which was not the fault of anyone at the farmhouse, but which was serious enough to make Anne Catherick resolve to leave Limeridge immediately. It was quite useless to press Mrs. Clements to be more explicit. She only shook her head, and said that, for Anne's sake, she must beg and pray that no one would question her. All she could repeat, with every appearance of being seriously agitated herself, was that Anne must go, and that she must go with her, and that the destination to which they might both betake themselves must be kept a secret from everybody. I spare you the recital of Mrs. Todd's hospitable remonstrances and refusals. It ended in her driving them both to the nearest station, more than three hours since. She tried hard, on the way, to get them to speak more plainly, but without success and she set them down outside the station door. So hurt and offended by the unceremonious abruptness of their departure and their unfriendly reluctance to place the least confidence in her, that she drove away in anger, without so much as stopping to bid them good-bye. That is exactly what has taken place. Search your own memory, Mr. Hartwright, and tell me if anything happened in the burial ground yesterday evening which can at all account for the extraordinary departure of those two women this morning. I should like to account first, Miss Halcombe, for the sudden change in Anne Catherick, which alarmed them at the farmhouse hours after she and I had parted, and when time enough had elapsed to quiet any violent agitation that I might have been unfortunate enough to cause. Did you inquire particularly about the gossip which was going on in the room when she turned faint? Yes, but Mrs. Todd's household affairs seemed to have divided her attention that evening with the talk in the farmhouse parlour. She could only tell me that it was just the news meaning, I suppose, that they all talked as usual about each other. "'The dairymaid's memory may be better than her mother's,' I said. "'It may be as well for you to speak to the girl, Miss Halcombe, as soon as we get back.' My suggestion was acted on the moment we returned to the house. Miss Halcombe led me round to the servants' offices, and we found the girl in the dairy, with her sleeves tucked up to her shoulders, cleaning a large milk-pan and singing blithely over her work. "'I brought this gentleman to see your dairy, Hannah,' said Miss Halcombe. "'It's one of the sights of the house, and it always does you credit.' The girl blushed and curtsied, and said shyly that she hoped she always did her best to keep things neat and clean. "'We've just come from your father's,' Miss Halcombe continued. "'You were there yesterday evening, I hear, and you found visitors at the house?' "'Yes, miss.' "'One of them was taken faint and ill, I'm told. I suppose nothing was said or done to frighten her.' "'You were talking of nothing very terrible, were you?' "'Oh, no, miss,' said the girl, laughing. "'We were only talking about the news.' "'Your sisters told you the news at Todd's Corner, I suppose?' "'Yes, miss.' "'And you told them the news at Limeridge House?' "'Yes, miss. "'And I'm quite sure nothing was said to frighten the poor thing. "'For I was talking when she was taken ill. "'It gave me quite a turn, miss, to see it, "'never having taken a faint myself.' Before any more questions could be put to her, she was called away to receive a basket of eggs at the dairy door. As she left us, I whispered to Miss Halcombe, "'Ask her if she happened to mention last night that visitors were expected at Limeridge House.' 
Miss Halcombe showed me by a look that she understood, and put the question as soon as the dairymaid returned to us. "'Oh, yes, miss, I mentioned that,' said the girl simply. "'The company coming and the accident to the brindled cow was all the news I had to take to the farm. "'Did you mention names? Did you tell them that Sir Percival Glyde was expected on Monday?' "'Yes, miss, I told them Sir Percival Glyde was coming. "'I hope there was no harm in it. I hope I didn't do wrong.' "'No, no, no harm. Come, Mr. Hartwright. "'Hannah will begin to think us in the way if we interrupt her any longer over her work.' We stopped and looked at one another the moment we were alone again. Is there any doubt in your mind now, Miss Halcombe? Sir Percival Glyde shall remove that doubt, Mr. Hartwright, or Laura Fairley shall never be his wife. 15. As we walked round the front of the house, a fly from the railway approached us along the drive. Miss Halcombe waited on the doorsteps until the fly drew up, and then advanced to shake hands with an old gentleman who got out briskly the moment the steps were let down. Mr. Gilmore had arrived. I looked at him when we were introduced to each other with an interest and a curiosity which I could hardly conceal. The old man was to remain at Limeridge House after I had left it. He was to hear Sir Percival Glyde's explanation, and was to give Miss Halcombe the assistance of his experience in forming her judgment. He was to wait until the question of the marriage was set at rest, and his hand, if that question was decided in the affirmative, was to draw the settlement which bound Miss Fairley irrevocably to her engagement. Even then, when I knew nothing by comparison with what I know now, I looked at the family lawyer with an interest which I had never felt before in the presence of any man breathing who was a total stranger to me. In external appearance Mr. Gilmore was the exact opposite of the conventional idea of an old lawyer. His complexion was florid. His white hair was worn rather long and kept carefully brushed. His black coat, waistcoat, and trousers fitted him with perfect neatness. His white cravat was carefully tied, and his lavender-coloured kid gloves might have adorned the hands of a fashionable clergyman without fear and without reproach. His manners were pleasantly marked by the formal grace and refinements of an old-school politeness, quickened by the invigorating sharpness and readiness of a man whose business in life obliges him always to keep his faculties in good working order. A sanguine constitution and fair prospects to begin with, a long subsequent career of creditable and comfortable prosperity, a cheerful, diligent, widely respected old age. Such were the general impressions I derived from my introduction to Mr. Gilmore, and it is but fair to him to add that the knowledge I gained by later and better experience only tended to confirm them. I left the old gentleman and Miss Halcombe to enter the house together, and to talk of family matters undisturbed by the risk of a stranger's presence. They crossed the hall on their way to the drawing-room, and I descended the steps again to wander about the garden alone. My hours were numbered at Limeridge House. My departure the next morning was irrevocably settled. My share in the investigation which the anonymous letter had rendered necessary was at an end. No harm could be done to anyone but myself if I let my heart loose again, for the little time that was left me, from the cold cruelty of restraint which necessity had forced me to inflict upon it and took my farewell of the scenes which were associated with the brief dream-time of my happiness and my love. I turned instinctively to the walk beneath my study window, where I had seen her the evening before with her little dog, and followed the path which her dear feet had trodden so often, till I came to the wicket gate that led into her rose-garden. The winter bareness spread drearily over it now. The flowers that she had taught me to distinguish by their names, the flowers that I had taught her to paint from, were gone, and the tiny white paths that led between the beds were damp and green already. I went on to the avenue of trees, where we had breathed together the warm fragrance of August evenings, where we had admired together the myriad combinations of shade and sunlight that dappled the ground at our feet. The leaves fell about me from the groaning branches and the earthly decay in the atmosphere chilled me to the bones. A little further on, and I was out of the grounds, and following the lane that wound gently upward to the nearest hills. The old felled tree by the wayside, on which we had sat to rest, was sodden with rain, and the tufts of ferns and grasses which I had drawn for her, nestling under the rough stone wall in front of us, had turned to a pool of water, 
stagnating round an island of draggled weeds. I gained the summit of the hill, and looked at the view which we had so often admired in happier time. It was cold and barren. It was no longer the view that I remembered. The sunshine of her presence was far from me. The charm of her voice no longer murmured in my ear. She had talked to me on the spot from which I now looked down, of her father, who was a last surviving parent, had told me how fond of each other they had been, and how sadly she missed him still when she entered certain rooms in the house, and when she took up forgotten occupations and amusements with which he had been associated. Was the view that I had seen while listening to those words the view that I saw now, standing on the hilltop by myself? I turned and left it. I wound my way down again over the moor and round the sand hills, down to the beach. There was the white rage of the surf, and the multitudinous glory of the leaping waves. But where was the place on which she had once drawn idle figures with her parasol in the sand? the place where we'd sat together while she talked to me about myself and my home, while she asked me a woman's minutely observant questions about my mother and my sister, and innocently wondered whether I should ever leave my lonely chambers and have a wife and a house of my own. Wind and wave had long since smoothed out the trace of her, which she'd left in those marks on the sand. I looked over the wide monotony of the seaside prospect, and the place in which we two had idled away the sunny hours, was as lost to me as if I had never known it, as strange to me as if I had stood already on a foreign shore. The empty silence of the beach struck cold to my heart. I returned to the house and garden, where traces were left to speak of her at every turn. On the west terrace walk I met Mr. Gilmore. He was evidently in search of me, for he quickened his pace when we caught sight of each other. The state of my spirits little fitted me for the society of a stranger, but the meeting was inevitable, and I resigned myself to make the best of it. "'You're the very person I wanted to see,' said the old gentleman. "'I had two words to say to you, my dear sir, and if you have no objection I will avail myself of the present opportunity. To put it plainly, Miss Halcombe and I have been talking over family affairs, affairs which are the cause of my being here, and in the course of our conversation she was naturally led to tell me of this unpleasant matter connected with the anonymous letter, and of the share which you have most creditably and properly taken in proceeding so far. That share, I quite understand, gives you an interest which you might not otherwise have felt, in knowing that the future management of the investigation which you have begun will be placed in safe hands. My dear sir, make yourself quite easy on that point. It will be placed in my hands." You are in every way, Mr. Gilmore, much fitter to advise and to act in the matter than I am. Is it an indiscretion on my part to ask if you have decided yet on a course of proceeding? So far as it is possible to decide, Mr. Hartwright, I have decided. I mean to send a copy of the letter, accompanied by a statement of the circumstances, to Sir Percival Glyde's solicitor in London, with whom I have some acquaintance. The letter itself I shall keep here to show to Sir Percival as soon as he arrives. Tracing of the two women I have already provided for, by sending one of Mr. Fairley's servants, a confidential person, to the station to make inquiries. The man has his money and his directions, and he will follow the women in the event of his finding any clue. This is all that can be done until Sir Percival comes on Monday. I have no doubt myself that every explanation which can be expected from a gentleman and a man of honour he will readily give. Sir Percival stands very high, sir an eminent position, a reputation above suspicion. I feel quite easy about the results. Quite easy, I am rejoiced to assure you. Things of this sort happen constantly in my experience. Anonymous letters, unfortunate woman, sad state of society. I don't deny that there are peculiar complications in this case, but the case itself is, most unhappily, common, common. I am afraid, Mr. Gilmore, I have the misfortune to differ from you in the view that I take of the case. Just so, my dear sir, just so. I am an old man, and I take the practical view. You are a young man, and you take the romantic view. Let us not dispute about our views. I live professionally in an atmosphere of disputation, Mr. Hartwright, and I am only too glad to escape from it, as I am escaping here. We will wait for events. Yes, yes, yes. We will wait for events. Charming place, this. Good shooting? Probably not. 
None of Mr. Fairley's land is preserved, I think. Charming place, though, and delightful people. You draw and paint, I hear, Mr. Hartwright. Enviable accomplishment. What style? We dropped into general conversation. Or rather, Mr. Gilmore talked, and I listened, and from the topics on which he discoursed so fluently. The solitary walk of the last two hours had wrought its effect on me. It had set the idea in my mind of hastening my departure from Limeridge House. Why should I prolong the hard trial of saying farewell by one unnecessary minute? What further service was required of me by any one? There was no useful purpose to be served in my stay in Cumberland. There was no restriction of time in the permission to leave which my employer had granted me. Why not end it there and then? I determined to end it. There were some hours of daylight still left. There was no reason why my journey back to London should not begin on that afternoon. I made the first civil excuse that occurred to me for leaving Mr. Gilmore, and returned at once to the house. On my way up to my own room I met Miss Halcombe on the stairs. She saw by the hurry of my movements and the change in my manner that I had some new purpose in view, and asked me what had happened. I told her the reasons which induced me to think of hastening my departure exactly as I have told them here. "'No, no,' she said, earnestly and kindly. "'Leave us like a friend. Break bread with us once more. Stay here and dine. Stay here and help us to spend our last evening with you as happily and as like our first evenings as we can. It's my invitation, Mrs. Vase's invitation.' She hesitated a little, and then added, "'Laura's invitation as well.' I promised to remain. God knows I had no wish to leave even the shadow of a sorrowful impression with any one of them. My own room was the best place for me till the dinner bell rang. I waited there until it was time to go downstairs. I had not spoken to Miss Fairley, I had not even seen her all that day. The first meeting with her when I entered the drawing room was a hard trial to her self control and to mine. She too had done her best to make our last evening renew the golden bygone time, the time that could never come again. She had put on the dress which I used to admire more than any other that she possessed, a dark blue silk trimmed quaintly and prettily with old-fashioned lace. She came forward to meet me with her former readiness. She gave me her hand with the frank, innocent goodwill of happier days, the cold fingers that trembled round mine, the pale cheeks with a bright red spot burning in the midst of them the faint smile that struggled to live on her lips and died away from them while I looked at it, told me that what sacrifice of herself her outward composure was maintained. My heart could take her no closer to me, or I should have loved her then as I had never loved her yet. Mr. Gilmore was a great assistance to us. He was in high good humour, and he led the conversation with unflagging spirit. Miss Halcombe seconded him resolutely and I did all I could to follow her example. The kind blue eyes, whose slightest changes of expression I had learnt to interpret so well, looked at me appealingly when we first sat down to table. Help my sister. The sweet anxious face seemed to say, Help my sister, and you will help me. We got through the dinner, to all outward appearance at least happily enough. When the ladies had risen from the table, Mr. Gilmore and I were left alone in the dining-room and a new interest presented itself to occupy our attention, and to give me an opportunity of quieting myself by a few minutes of needful and welcome silence. The servant who had been dispatched to trace Anne Catherick and Mrs. Clements returned with his report, and was shown into the dining-room immediately. "'Well,' said Mr. Gilmore, "'what have you found out?' "'I found out, sir,' answered the man, "'that both the woman took tickets at our station here for Carlisle.' "'You went to Carlisle, of course, when you heard that?' I did, sir. But I'm sorry to say I could find no further trace of them. You inquired at the railway? Yes, sir. Uh, and at the different inns? Yes, sir. And you left the statement I wrote for you at the police station? I did, sir. Well, my friend, you've done all you could, and I've done all I could. And there the matter must rest until further notice. We've played our trump cards, Mr. Hartwright, continued the old gentleman when the servant had withdrawn. For the present, at least, the women have outmanoeuvred us and our only resource now is to wait till Sir Percival Glyde comes here on Monday next. Would you fill your glass again? Good bottle of port, that. Sound substantial, old wine. I have got better in my cellar, though. We returned to the drawing-room, the room in which the happiest evenings of my life had been passed, 
the room which after this last night I was never to see again. Its aspect was altered, since the days had shortened and the weather had grown cold. The glass doors on the terrace side were closed, and hidden by thick curtains. Instead of the soft twilight obscurity in which we used to sit, the bright radiant glow of lamplight now dazzled my eyes. All was changed, indoors and out. All was changed. Miss Halcombe and Mr. Gilmore sat down together at the card-table. Mrs. Vesey took her customary chair. There was no restraint on the disposal of their evening. And I felt restraint on the disposal of mine all the more painfully from observing it. I saw Miss Fairley lingering near the music-stand. The time had been when I might have joined her there. I waited irresolutely. I knew neither where to go nor what to do next. She cast one quick glance at me, took a piece of music suddenly from the stand, and came towards me of her own accord. "'Shall I play some of those little melodies of Mozart's which you used to like so much?' she asked, op opening the music nervously, and looking down at it while she spoke. Before I could thank her, she hastened to the piano. The chair near it, which I had always been accustomed to occupy, stood empty. She struck a few chords, then glanced round at me, and then looked back again at the music. "'Won't you take your old place?' she said, speaking very abruptly and in very low tones. "'I may take it on the last night,' I answered. She did not reply. She kept her attention riveted on the music, music which she knew by memory, which she had played over and over again in former times without the book. I only knew she had heard me. I only knew that she was aware of my being close to her, by seeing the red spot on the cheek that was nearest me fade out, and her face grow pale all over. "'I'm very sorry you're going,' she said, her voice almost sinking to a whisper, her eyes looking more and more intently at the music, her fingers flying over the keys of the piano with a strange, feverish energy which I had never noticed in her before. "'I shall remember those kind words, Miss Fairley, long after to-morrow has come and gone.' Paleness grew whiter on her face, and she turned it further away from me. "'Don't speak of to-morrow,' she said. Let the music speak to us of to-night, in a happier language than ours." Her lips trembled. A faint sigh fluttered from them, which she tried vainly to suppress. Her fingers wavered on the piano. She struck a false note, confused herself in trying to set it right, and dropped her hands angrily on her lap. Miss Halcombe and Mr. Gilmore looked up in astonishment from the card-table at which they were playing. Even Mrs. Vesey, dozing in her chair, woke at the sudden cessation of the music, and inquired what had happened. "'You play at whist, Mr. Hartwright?' asked Miss Halcombe, with her eyes directed significantly at the place I occupied. I knew what she meant. I knew she was right. And I rose at once to go to the card-table. As I left the piano, Miss Fairley turned a page of the music, and touched the keys again with a surer hand. "'I will play it,' she said striking the notes almost passionately. I will play it on the last night. "'Come, Mrs. Vesey,' said Miss Halcombe. "'Mr. Gilmore and I are tired of Eckhart's. Come and be Mr. Hartwright's partner at whist.' The old lawyer smiled satirically. His had been the winning hand, and he had just turned up a king. He evidently attributed Miss Halcombe's abrupt change at the card-table arrangements to a lady's inability to play a losing game. The rest of the evening passed without a word or a look from her. She kept her place at the piano, and I kept mine at the card-table. She played unintermittingly, played as if the music was her only refuge from herself. Sometimes her fingers touched the notes with a lingering fondness, a soft, plaintive, dying tenderness, unutterably beautiful and mournful to hear. Sometimes they faltered and failed her, or hurried over the instrument mechanically as if their task was a burden to them but still, change and waver as they might in the expression they imparted to the music, their resolution to play never faltered. She only rose from the piano when we all rose to say good-night. Mrs. Vesey was nearest to the door, and the first to shake hands with me. "'I shall not see you again, Mr. Hartwright,' said the old lady. "'I am truly sorry you are going away. You have been very kind and attentive, and an old woman like me feels kindness and attention. I wish you happy, sir.' I wish you a kind good-bye." Mr. Gilmore came next. "'I hope we shall have future opportunity of bettering our acquaintance, Mr. Hartwright. 
You quite understand about the little matter of business being safe in my hands? Yes, yes, of course. Bless me, how cold it is. Don't let me keep you at the door. Bon voyage, my dear sir, bon voyage, as the French say. Miss Halcombe followed. Half past seven tomorrow morning, she said, and then added in a whisper, I've heard and seen more than you think. Your conduct tonight has made me your friend for life. Miss Fairley came last. I could not trust myself to look at her when I took her hand, and when I thought of the next morning. My departure must be an early one, I said. I shall be gone, Miss Fairley, before you— No, no, she interposed hastily. Not before I'm out of my room. I shall be down to breakfast with Marian. I am not so ungrateful nor so forgetful of the past three months. Her voice failed her. Her hand closed gently round mine, and then dropped it suddenly. Before I could say good-night, she was gone. The end comes fast to meet me, comes inevitably, as the light of the last morning came to Limeridge House. It was barely half-past seven when I went downstairs, but I found them both at the breakfast-table waiting for me. In the chill air, in the dim light, in the gloomy morning silence of the house, we three sat down together, and tried to eat, tried to talk. The struggle to preserve appearances was hopeless and useless, and I rose to end it. As I held up my hand, as Miss Halcombe, who was nearest to me, took it, Miss Fairley turned away suddenly and hurried from the room. "'Better so,' said Miss Halcombe, when the door had closed. "'Better so for you and for her.' I waited a moment before I could speak. It was hard to lose her without a parting word or a parting look. I controlled myself. I tried to take leave of Miss Halcombe in fitting terms, but all the farewell words I would fain have spoken dwindled to one sentence. "'Have I deserved that you should write to me?' was all I could say. "'You have nobly deserved everything I can do for you, as long as we both live. Whatever the end is, you shall know it. And if I can ever be of help again, in, at any future time, long after the memory of my presumption and my folly is forgotten—' I could add no more. My voice faltered. My eyes moistened in spite of me. She caught me by both hands. She pressed them with the strong, steady grasp of a man. Her dark eyes glittered. Her brown complexion flushed deep. The force and energy of her face glowed and grew beautiful, with the pure inner light of her generosity and her pity. "'I will trust you. If ever the time comes, I will trust you as my friend and her friend, as my brother and her brother.' She stopped, drew me nearer to her. The fearless, noble creature touched my forehead, sister-like, with her lips, and called me by my Christian name. "'God bless you, Walter,' she said. "'Wait here alone and compose yourself. I better not stay for both our sakes. I had better see you go from the balcony upstairs.' She left the room. I turned away towards the window, where nothing faced me but the lonely autumn landscape. I turned away to master myself, before I too left the room in my turn and left it for ever. A minute passed, it could hardly have been more, when I heard the door open again softly, and the rustling of a woman's dress on the carpet moved towards me. My heart beat violently as I turned round. Miss Fairley was approaching me from the further end of the room. She stopped and hesitated when our eyes met, and when she saw that we were alone, then, with that courage which women lose so often in the small emergency, and so seldom in the great, she came nearer to me, strangely pale and strangely quiet, drawing one hand after her along the table by which she walked, and holding something at her side in the other which was hidden in the folds of her long dress. "'I only went to the drawing-room,' she said, to look for this. It may remind you of your visit here, and of the friends you leave behind you. You told me I had improved very much when I did it, and I thought you might like she turned her head away, and offered me a little sketch, drawn throughout by her own pencil, of the summer-house in which we had first met. The paper trembled in her hand as she held it out to me, trembled in mine as I took it from her. I was afraid to say what I felt. I only answered, "'It shall never leave me. All my life long it shall be the treasure I prize most. I am very grateful for it, very grateful to you for not letting me go away without bidding you good-bye.' Oh, she said innocently, how can I let you go, after we've passed so many happy days together? Those days may never return, Miss Fairley. My way of life and yours are very far apart. 
but if a time should come when the devotion of my whole heart and soul and strength will give you a moment's happiness or spare you a moment's sorrow will you try to remember the poor drawing-master who taught you miss halcombe has promised to trust me will you promise too the farewell sadness in the kind blue eyes shone dimly through her gathering tears i promise it she said in broken tones oh don't look at me like that i promise it with all my heart i ventured a little nearer to her and held out my hand you have many friends who love you miss fairley your happy future is the dear object of many hopes may i say at parting that it is the dear object of my hopes too the tears flowed fast down her cheeks she rested one trembling hand on the table to steady herself while she gave me the other i took it in mine i held it fast my head drooped over it my tears fell on it my lips pressed it not in love oh not in love at that last moment but in the agony and the self-abandonment of despair for god's sake leave me she said faintly the confession of her heart's secret burst from her in those pleading words i had no right to hear them no right to answer them they were the words that banished me in the name of her sacred weakness from the room it was all over i dropped her hand i said no more the blinding tears shut her out from my eyes and i dashed them away to look at her for the last time one look as she sank into a chair as her arms fell on the table as her fair head drooped on them wearily one farewell look and the door had closed upon her the great gulf of separation had opened between us the image of laura fairly was a memory of the past already the end of hartwright's narrative end of track 6